likes to tease you. Here we are. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us on Emily's YouTube channel as well as Brattleboro Community Television. We are recording, pre recording this on February 8th, and it will air on WV. EW on the 12th, just an FYI in case anything changes between now and then, since we are talking about the current legislative process. I want to welcome to the show Representative Emily Kornheiser from Brattleboro. How are you, Emily? Hi, Olga. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. And someone we have not seen in a while, Chloe Leary, who is the head of the Winston Prouty Center for Child and Family Development in Brattleboro. Oh, that's a mouthful. Okay. So glad you can join us, Chloe. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. We are going to talk today, <clears throat> excuse me, about the child care system in Vermont, specifically a bill called H-171, which Emily is one of the many co-sponsors for. And it wants to do a number of things. It wants to expand um, financial eligibility for, for families to access early childcare. Um, also create uh, some new modernization for the computer systems and tracking and data collection. Establish some scholarships for people who are either currently in, uh, employed as childcare workers or who want to become childcare workers. It's also requiring some education completion as well as establishing an early uh, care and education governance and administration advisory committee. So <laughs> it's pulling a lot of levers at once. Um, I wanna start with you, Emily, and just talk to, let listeners know, why was it important for you to co-sponsor this bill? And um, I don't wanna toot my own horn or correct you very early in the show, Oka, but I was actually one of the lead five lead sponsors of this bill and worked to get 90 co-sponsors on it. Um, well done. See, they don't say you. that on the legislative website. They don't, but just sneak, sneaky trick for anyone <laughs> looking at a piece of legislation. The lead sponsors are the first few, and then the alphabet starts for co-sponsors from there. Mm -hmm. um, Good to so, know. Yeah. Um, and we decided to put the lead sponsors alphabetically so that no one would have any, we didn't have to worry about our feelings, but you don't always put lead sponsors alphabetically either. So on the family medical leave bill, there's two leads and um, Rep. Robin Shai's name is before mine, even though there are a lot of co-sponsors after that because she worked on it last biennium too. So I felt like she deserved extra credit. Very small pieces of ego, not, ego nuance that now everyone has access to forevermore. So, um, and I love nuance. that you as a reporter didn't even know that. So it's like definitely ego nuance that only other legislators care about. <laughs> This is anyway, true. <laughs> so the bill is much more important than the ego nuance of the bill. And um, I'm really excited to work on this bill because our child care system, as we've talked about extensively, and as I worked on before I was a legislator even, um, is in serious disarray. And it's in disarray in a number of different ways that if we pull just one policy lever to fix it, all of the other things will get even worse. Um, and so the specific policy levers that I think are really important to address and that we address in this bill are families have a very hard time paying for childcare, even up to like fairly high salary thresholds. So if a family is making $80,000 a year, but, but they're paying $30,000 for childcare and they are adults with student loan debt and they're trying to pay for housing in a community like ours, where that might be 40% of their income, we have already crossed the threshold of 100% in that calculation. Mm -hmm. So really it's unaffordable for the vast, vast majority of Vermonters. There aren't enough childcare spots for everyone who needs one. And what that means is that we have mostly women who are not part of the workforce when their kids are young because 
women tend to make less than men. And so when someone's going to leave the workforce, generally it's the person who makes less money who decides to do that. We've talked so much on the show about the long-term financial and social implications of women leaving the workforce for long periods of time. Pile on effects well into social security times. Yeah. And then childcare workers don't make a living wage. So this means one, there's kind of a disincentive to go into the field that has a huge staffing shortage. Two, there's a huge disincentive to get the kinds of really high quality training and education that we would really love the childcare workforce to have so that they can have high quality education for the children that are in their care. And three, one that sits with me probably the most often of them, that we have people living in the chronic stress of poverty, caring for kids who are often in chronic stress themselves. And that creates such a spinning storm of struggle for everyone. So one, two, so this bill raises wages for childcare workers. And then the last part is really having those workers get the education that they need to do the job they need, but unaffordable again, because of the wage problem. And then there's also other pieces that we've talked about so much about how actually government functions and how, um, administ how programs are governed. And so this bill has fixes for that related to like, you know, ancient IT systems and governance systems that aren't necessarily responsive to the field and stuff like that. But those are sort of the three high level things. And I'm excited about it because we're pulling multiple policy levers at once so as not to crash the system while improving it. So Chloe, I want to hear from you in a second, but I just wanted to go back to Emily and ask, so the pandemic has thrown my sense of time completely out of whack, but it was either last session, it was last session, the legislature passed a child care bill that pulled a number of levers too, or levers too. How does this, you know, what's new about this bill compared to what's already happened? So this is the next step in what is really like a, probably a 10 year plan. So okay. this bill lays out five years of what we need to do around financing the system, financing the education of the people in the system, financing for the parents um, to get their kids part of receiving care and financing to pay the people in the system. What we passed previously um, was sort of the temporary fix that would get us to this point. So it expanded eligibility to a lot more families. Um, it put some money into the system to pay for education and training for workers. Um, but it was really a baby step towards this sort of big, broad five-year plan. Thank you. Chloe, you have done a lot of work in the community, really trying to bring home for community members, whether they have children or not, how the lack of childcare um, impacts the economy as a whole and is actually not great for businesses or families. What about this, this bill H-171 that excites you at this point? It's a great bill. I'm just happy to see it. I really appreciate Emily and the other four co-sponsors and then 95 people signing on tells me that we have made a lot of progress and people recognizing exactly what you're saying. That childcare is a building block and actually there's text in the bill that says it, that this is, it's a, you know, an a irreplaceable piece of our economic development. So, um, and I think the fact that it's multifaceted is what is probably most exciting because it's so discouraging when there's one, you know, one piece of legislation that might do one thing and has unintended consequences and undermines the rest of the system. So this holistic approach is um, heartening and hopeful, frankly, that if you can um, you know, make it affordable, help people enter the field, because that's been a conundrum actually. It's like the only way we could raise wages right now is if we increase tuition, which makes it more unaffordable. Well, it feels awful to not pay a living wage and we try and we do lots of other things to make a good workplace, but without that, um, you, you know, that fundamental but a revenue or funding stream, we wouldn't, we can't, we're stuck. So, um, you know, so being able to increase wages without increasing tuition, and in fact, making it 10% uh, or less of family's income for to pay tuition, like that's remarkable. It's, it's just, um, 
really hopeful. So those are some of the things that I'm most excited about. We already invest a lot in our workforce. We help people pay for classes. I mean, right now it's, um, we put out an ad, we are not getting any responses. Like we have another classroom we could open. I, I, I can't get, you know, people in the door. So um, so we get people in the door and then we're, we encourage them to take classes and then we help them pay for their classes. So that whole professional development piece is also, um, I think a critical part of building the whole field. So um, it's a great bill. I, we, it's been years in coming, as Emily said, this is like building blocks and baby steps. So it's pretty exciting to see, um, to see it all in one place. Can I read the finding section, Olga? Um, Cause I think that's sort of that big picture that Chloe was touching on. Yes, that's the one that talks about the, the Georgetown study and yep. such. Yeah, is yeah. that okay? Please go ahead. Okay. Um, so the bill begins with findings and legislative intent, which um, bills sometimes don't, but sort of bigger banner bills, it's really good to lay the stage here. And so um, I'll read this. The General Assembly finds that childcare is an essential component of Vermont's economy. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, three out of five Vermont's youngest children did not have access to the amount of childcare needed by their families. Three out of five. According to the Georgetown University Center on Education Workforce, early childhood educators are the lowest paid college graduates of any degree program. And we know that's mostly women. That part's not in the language, so I'm just adding that. The Vermont Early Care and Learning Dividend Study found that increased investment in early care and education as described in the recommendations of Vermont's Blue Ribbon Commission, which Chloe sat on, I believe, um, would yield $3.08 for every additional dollar invested in the system. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated already pressing challenges, making it even harder for families to find affordable, high quality childcare and more difficult for early childhood education programs to find and retain qualified educators. Again, the sort of two sides of the coin. The Coalition for Strong America found that in a national childcare economic study that the US economy loses $57 billion annually due to childcare challenges. The US Chamber of Commerce found that high quality childcare is a powerful two generation workforce development strategy that strengthens today's workforce while their kids are in school and puts children on the path to develop well and enter kindergarten ready to thrive in school, work, and life. Therefore, it is the intent of the General Assembly that immediate investments are necessary to support Vermont's economy, ensure that all families of young children have affordable access to high quality early childhood and that Vermont's early childhood educators, the backbone of our economy, I love that part, are fairly compensated and well supported. And the, co the lead sponsors on this bill are from the Human Services Committee, so people who really care deeply about early childhood development, but also people who see sort of the long-term effects of um, trauma and um, prison pipeline, all that stuff. Um, the Education Committee, who sees the long-term impacts or sort of the medium-term impacts of kids not getting solid early care. The, um, economic Development and Commerce Committee, who see the impacts of the shortages in our workforce today, because women are not entering the workforce or dropping out of the workforce, and sees um, the longer term implications of that. And then the Appropriations and Ways and Means Committee, because this is a deep financing and funding issue. So, Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Uh, Chloe, you know, for folks who aren't currently with small children, and aren't currently trying to find childcare. What do you think they need to know or understand now about Vermont's childcare system uh, to help them have a better grasp of, of this issue? I'm not sure if it's how to understand the system versus just understand how important it is to their own well being, also. So in the same way that we've agreed that uh, investing in public education, investing in our children K through 12 is important and everybody seems to recognize that. Um, it's really critical for people who don't have kids to know that the, these are our youngest citizens. They need a good start. And just like the language in the bill says, it's a two generation economic development approach. So if you care about economic development, you should care about childcare. If you care about healthcare, you should care about childcare. If you care about any housing, you know, like I'm, you know, there's a, I will give uh, kudos to Allie Richards uh, for this phrase, tell me what you care about and I'll tell you why you should care about childcare. So helping people connect those dots and understand, you know, I, I wish I could say like, it's just the right thing to do and that that would be enough. I'll say it, it's the right thing to do. Sometimes that is not enough to convince people. So 
um, you know, helping people understand how it impacts them also in whatever arena of their life. So I think, you know, that's sort of a vague answer to your question, but it's, uh, you know, people um, understanding like that children, uh, you know, are, there are children, right? It's not a family's child. It's all of our children because it's all of our communities and all of our states. That's what I would start with anyway. Can you also, I love that. Um, and I love that it's all our children. The first time I ever heard someone say that was um, Margaret Atkinson when she was sitting next to me at town meeting. And I know she works at the Winston Crowdy Center now. So that's nice. Um, I wonder if you could also help us get our heads around what it's like to be the parent of a young child looking for care and trying to afford care. Yeah, so right now in Wyndham County, if you have, uh, first of all, wait lists are full of people who are pregnant. Like if you're pregnant, call right now. Do not wait till you're a couple months, you know, you're like, oh, I'll call for childcare when I'm almost due. Or, um, so you, you call, you know, childcare resource and referral. You hear about lots of programs. You hope they have openings near you that you can get to and afford. Um, and that fits sort of what you're looking for. And then you hope they have space. So, um, and then once you cover that, for, so for instance, I, I don't know exactly off the top of my head how many infant spots we have in Broward and Wyndham County or this area right now, but it's not a lot, you know, it's, um, and then there's a pandemic effect. So I think that that's a, well, it'll be interesting to see, you know, as we come out, I don't want to jinx ourselves as we come out of the pandemic, because <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> I say. Um, so, you know, maybe there are three infant spots on all of, you know, our catchment area. So, you know, people get a little stressed out about that. So then you have to figure out how to afford it. And then you have to, you know, if you can just afford it out of pocket because you're not eligible for financial assistance, you know, some people take out a, you know, a home equity loan on their house. I did um, to pay for childcare. So, or you jump through some hoops to apply for childcare. It's, um, and then, you know, I think that, it's interesting that I, the financial assistance program is, I think, a critical piece of make, making that accessible, making it work for people. Because if you get a, like in terms of income eligibility, if you have a 10%, you know, you get a 10% benefit, it's not enough to jump through the hoops to apply for financial assistance if you get, you know, just a little bit a month. So um, it's just, and so then you have to decide, am I going to go to work or not? <laughs> and then what are the hours of the child care and transportation and, um, so it is quite a puzzle and a, and a, a big, um, you know, I, I think a big question for families, should we do it or not? Or should we stay at somebody stay at home and, and figure out how to make it work? So, and right, you know, I think that what's been interesting about the pandemic is lots of people have figured it out, but at what cost? You know, and, that, and I think it, we're hearing about it more because school-aged kids, not just our infants through five-year-olds. So people are doing a lot of juggling and we all know how that's going. Like, doesn't feel good, people's mental health is suffering, you know, all of those, those things. So it's, um, it's a lot of moving pieces to try to grapple with. Emily, there's a, a part of the bill that I wanted to touch base with you on because it seems like a lot of the legislation I've been reading lately has this component to me, which component to it, which is some form of advisory committee. Um, what role are you hoping that advisory committee will play is my question to Emily. And then for Chloe, what role do you need that advisory committee to play? Um, what, can you tell me where you are? Because there's two different advisory committees in the bill. So there's one that advises the child development division and then there's one that's going to sort of advise the financing system. I was looking specifically in the... Um, the top of the bill when they talk about establishing early care and education governance and administration oh, okay. advisory committee. So um, here's a funny thing. The Agency of Human Services used to, um, every single division of it, used to have both an ombuds type position. Um, so sort of that like external watchdog, um, help you solve your problems person and had um, an advisory committee made up of people from impacted communities and people working in the system. Um, and very few of them have those anymore. The Children's Integrated Service still does because it's required by our federal funding partner. Um, 
but not a lot of that going around. So child development is really, um, it's really just as complex as all of our other systems, but um, I think it's far enough along in its development that we're able to acknowledge that it's really complex. And so it's really right at the crux between the deeply human side of human services, the education um, side of human services and small business regulatory challenges. And so those three things together sit within the child development division right now and require a lot of input from all of these different community partners because when they make a decision, it might only, you don't wanna make decisions based on just sort of the narrow eyes of your own bureaucracy. You wanna make decisions so that you understand the implications for all of your partners in the field. Mm -hmm. And so it's putting together a group to really look at how all those things are governed. There's also this very funny thing um, about our pre-K program um, and how that wound up. So as people might or might not know, we funded 10 hours of pre-kindergarten a few years ago, um, which is essentially 10 hours of childcare that's publicly funded through our education fund um, for sort of four-year-olds, three and four-year-olds. Um, but it's just 10 hours and which is sort of a weird shot in the bucket and I'm not really, I'm glad I wasn't in the legislature for whatever decisions led to that strange choice around 10 hours. But <laughs> um, because that's part of the ed fund and I'm sure because of arguments that happened before I was in the legislature, the education, the agency of education is involved in that. And so there's this really like pretty endless turf battle between the child development division and the agency of education that has lasted through ch significant changes in leadership um, and seems still quite unresolved. And Chloe, I think has a lot to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, and, and just to say, so an advisory committee that's cross sector is, and looking at governance is necessary, important. I had no idea that there used to be such entities before. And I, I think that that's a great thing to look at to bring back because um, it's so important for, I think, the, for our government, uh, state government and federal, frankly, but to understand what happens in people's lives and how, and how that plays out and then make policies based on that, not just on, are we going to save money or how does it look on paper? So I think um, what I would hope for from a governance committee like this and what, and actually as I was Reading the bill, I got a little bit hopeful in the face of the governor's proposal to move um, to essentially take apart the child development division. So it's not the um, commissioner um, Brown, Sean Brown, testified uh, January 29th to House Human Services and House Education about the governor's uh, proposal to move um, things, uh, child development, uh, child care, child care licensing into the agency of education. Uh, to move home visiting, which is in child development division, to the Vermont Department of Health, and then other pieces will stay in AHS. So essentially, disband the child development division and uh, and get a, do away with children's integrated services. Essentially, is the proposal on the table. Um, and so this kind of, I think this committee can help us elevate the fact that outcomes are better when we integrate things. If we go back into our silos and have, you know, we have to protect our turf. That's a great word for it. And I don't know why these agencies, I don't know what the barriers and challenges are. I, and, but that seems to me a place to start and a governance committee like this could do that. And that is so important. We have got to have that. Um, I, you know, I will just say, I'm very worried that even though it's just a proposal from the administration, there are many ways that I think it's actively being implemented right now. You know, it's, you know, no, no, we're going to talk about it. What they're going to talk about is how to do it, not whether or not to do it. We have got to change the conversation to, is this even a good idea at all? So this kind of, and I know we're, I, you know, like it can't happen fast enough. I'm feeling a little anxious, but this kind of um, oversight committee could really help shape that conversation. Should we even do this? Not how should we do it? So. I really, um, it is really, interesting feels like the wrong word. It's really troubling how the administration put forward a proposal to essentially to do away with the child development division, um, to move it away from sort of the human piece of human services 
And even though the legislature had a pretty like across the board, no way we have no interest in doing this, it's a terrible idea. Um, as like an out of the gate response and the Agency of Human Services sort of backpedaled, there are still change, they are still able um, to put significant changes in place that will then make this inevitable. So the, the head of that division position um, has been open for quite a while and no one seems to be being appointed to fill that position. Include, and the second position below that person is also vacant. So there is no leadership at this division that they are considering dissolving. And the longer they put off appointing someone into leadership in that division, A, the easier it is for them to say, oh, they don't really do anything and no one's advocating for them, so let's do it. Because, I mean, no one's advocating because they didn't appoint anyone to advocate. Right. And two, it's really very difficult for a division to be effective and to testify in the legislature if there's no leadership there to do it, because generally the deputy commissioner or the commissioner is who shows up to talk to us about the work of the division. It's really, um, I wish they were on my side because they're very good at their work. <laughs> I know. I, and it's, um, you know, my, I actually have drafted a commentary that I'm getting ready to submit on that exactly some of the things you just said that effectively, even though nobody's really supporting it, there are many things you can do. You can starve the division off the vine, essentially. And so I think they are, um, they're appointing an interim deputy commissioner, um, not somebody familiar with CDD. So, and then, it, yeah, they were, it was announced, we're not gonna fill the, the Children's Integrated Services Director position because of the uncertainty of the, of the governor's proposal. I'm like, no, you, that, that's so right. If you don't have leadership, and actually nobody from CDD testified to House Human Services and Education to the Joint Committee. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how we turn that ship. It feels like the, or that's a mixed metaphor. I was gonna say the trains left the station, turn the ship, but we have to figure out how to have these conversations. And it's not that things can't be improved. Of course we can make improvements, um, but to throw the baby out with the bathwater is just, um, it's, it's irresponsible, frankly, and it's not going to get us better outcomes. It's not going to be more efficient and it's not going to be less expensive. Integrating, working together, collaborating. Yeah, sure, it costs a little bit of money to have people work together, but in the long run, just like statistics, that's when you invest the time in it, you will pay dividends later. So we have got to figure that out. And if, it's, if we're doing this because we can't figure out 10 hours of pre-K a week, give me $3,000 from somewhere else. I don't want that, <laughs> you know, like let's not up in the system because that's the, that's the place where there's all this tension, right? Yeah. Wow, sorry, don't get me going. <laughs> this is exactly, get, getting this people going is exactly going what for. this show's for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chloe. Um, we need to go to break and hear from some of our underwriters here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, but we shall return in a moment, stay tuned. Um, I, and it, I think it's true through for other ages of education too. But in early childhood, um, you know, I always say don't don't get into early childhood because you like kids, <laughs> because you better like the whole family <laughs> and the adults too. And so this focus on um, families and kids, it, it's about education and health and development and a social emotional well being, which is why children's integrated services as a model is so important. And so if we just pull out child. I, and again, I think this, like, this is great. This is great. I'd love you to, to share that on air. Um, that's perfect, Chloe. Thank you. I started doing recording. So, ah, well, then I just, had better. Sorry, because she just jumped it. She jumped in oh, and went sorry. in for it. So, no, don't be sorry. <laughs> so, well, I better introduce us back to the radio show then. Uh, welcome back to the second half <laughs> of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters. And if you're just joining us, we are speaking with Representative Emily Kornheiser and Chloe Leary of Winston Prouty. So, um, some of you may have heard, uh, if you're watching on Facebook, Chloe was talking a little bit about uh, early childhood education and childcare and how they fit together and how they're only little pieces of each other. Uh, so Chloe, if you wouldn't mind for the sake of our radio listeners, uh, revisiting that please. Sure, um, so I was just, I'm curious about, I think this bill does a really great job of calling out childcare and supporting the childcare system. And really I think, um, 
and connecting it to early childhood systems. So child development is this really broad field that involves education and health and social emotional well-being and and working with families. So as I said earlier, don't get into early childhood because you like kids. You better like the grown-ups too, <laughs> including the, the parents and, the, and your colleagues and because we all have to work together to make it successful. And so um, figuring out um, you know how to how to make sure that childcare um, that people rep, uh, realize that it's part of this sort of continuum or web of services and and interconnected with all of these other services as well. I think that that's as I said earlier. I think that's true of um, even in elementary school that we could do a lot better around you know figuring out how to wrap around or think about the whole child, the whole family, and support them. And so. I think there are ways this bill does that, and I would just want to keep that lens on it. Or, or and I'm curious if you know that I have a sense that the sponsors are aware of that. Um, and then how can we just keep that at the forefront? Because I'm worried it would just go right back into childcare, childcare, childcare versus early childhood. So for folks who may not be familiar with child care and early child education, I think a lot of people think of when they hear child care, they think of babysitting. Um, or they think of kids just showing up and playing. And that's not to say that kids aren't always learning whether they're playing or not, but it, I think it might help Chloe if you just uh, talk to us about what childcare is, what early child education is and how they are, um, like what's happening if, if someone were to observe a childcare center. Can I name something before Chloe jumps in that I think is a helpful frame? The phrase early care and education is one that we sort of use regularly to refer to this, you know, particular space and time and thing we do. And I think um, the use of and people think that it means there's caregiving and there's education and both of those things happen. And sort of one of the funny things about the pre-K 10 hours that we were talking about, is like 10 hours is enough for education and then the care is separate. But early care and education, they're not two separate things that happen. It's that everything is care and education. They are integrated activities. Um, yeah, go for it, Chloe. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I'll fall back on the um, statistics that I hope many um, viewers have heard, which is 80% of the brains developed by age three and 90% by age five before kids even get to school. And as you just said, Olga, every moment is learning. Like if your brain is developing that quickly, how, um, you know, how, how you sit down and eat or how someone helps you, you know, play on the playground, all of those things are our education. And so um, you know, that's not just, and then quality is the piece, I think, where um, we, we really can have that conversation about, um, you know, babysitting, which is fine, there's a time and a place for everything, is about a baseline of safety, right, theoretically, um, versus understanding child development and how to maximize and optimize development and brain development, which is the early care and education part of it. So, and was exactly right. Integrating those things and understanding they are inseparable from each other um, is really important. So I, you know, I use childcare. I mean early care and education when I say childcare, but a lot of people, it's a shorthand. I don't love it, but at least people know what I'm talking about. So. Thank you, Chloe. Um, you, you also uh, have some questions, I think, uh, that you want people to keep in mind just around how big a heavy lift uh, H171 is. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit, Chloe? I'm just curious, actually, I'd love to hear from Emily, given her experience and perspective that, you know, um, how do these big ticket bills move through? Do they get pared down really easily? How can we um, sort of keep it all together? Because it is so important all together. Like if somebody says, oh, let's just pull out this one piece and fund that, that's that's not going to make any sense. So, um, you know, if we're asking for twelve point one two five million dollars, that's a four. I know that there was a little four dollar thing in there. <laughs> like, um, then how can we get that? What is you know? So, um, one of my greatest sorrows and frustrations in the legislature is that we have great ideas, or people come to the legislature with great ideas um, from you know, community agencies and academics about how to make a difference. 
And then we underfund them to such an extent um, that we say, wait, that thing that you said was going to work didn't work. And it didn't work because we didn't actually implement it because we didn't allocate enough money to implement it properly. And that's why it didn't work. So don't go around mm -hmm. saying that thing didn't work. Um, so super concerned about that always. Um, some areas for optimism that I have with regards to this bill are one, this is the number one priority of the Democratic caucus and I, the House and I believe in the Senate. Um, this was the, it's the top line thing whenever anyone is asked um, House leadership of what they're focusing on. It was the top line thing that came up when um, we had our sort of before the session started full day retreat caucus for the caucus. It's um, a really top priority. Um, two, we had all these co-sponsors. So we have all these people that are really invested in this bill. And that is folks from all three parties, as well as a bunch of independents, few independents. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, and then we have a lot more money this year than anyone thought we would have. So the revenue projections from July were terrifying. And it turns out we actually have a surplus this year, um, which is so strange considering how um, unstable and um, desperate the world out there feels right now. Um, but the significant amounts of federal spending that have been coming into Vermont have really made a difference and people are spending money while they're at home or um, having a really hard time at work or whatever it is. Um, so we actually do have revenue to support this. Um, and then the other thing that makes me hopeful is one of the heavy lifts financially in this bill is the IT infrastructure changes. And the governor's budget had a pretty hefty ask on IT infrastructure. And so that feels nice that it um, seems like a bipartisan ask to do something that in previous years was considered really ever since um, the failures of the health exchange. IT investment has been deeply unsexy and sort of a political um, landmine. And it feels like everyone's finally on board to be like, oh, maybe we shouldn't be depending on computer systems from the 80s to meet Vermonters needs. So those are all the reasons that I am um, feeling hopeful that this might be able to make it through somewhat intact. Also, sorry, the last thing is that this bill was developed in like pretty deep collaboration with the field. So it's not like we got a hot idea and then all of these people who actually know what's going on come in and testify and are like, that's a cool idea, but paragraph three is a terrible idea and then it gets clunked out. There was such broad agreement going into this bill that we know that folks who come in to testify will come in likely in support of it. And so that also feels good. Great, thank you, Emily. Yeah. You mentioned during the break that you wanted to talk about expanding uh, the level of assistance uh, for families and um, one thing I find interesting about this, and you mentioned it, was raising the cap on, on income earning. And I think a lot of folks, when they hear that, they think, well, why does someone who earns so much more need that kind of support? And I would say my immediate reaction and why I'm excited about this part is wages in Vermont are really not where they need to be and their cost of, they're not in line with cost of living. And so, yes, a lot of families do need more support than, than we, may, we may think. And that's, that's my response, but I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts, Emily. Yeah, um, I'm really excited about this. I, there's a few pieces of it. Um, the biggest piece for me though, is what we've talked about with Deb Brighton two weeks ago. Yes. Deb is this, uh, Brighton from the Tax Commission. Yes, the head of the Tax Commission um, and a longtime legislative affiliated economist. Um, she does, she's done this, all of these really interesting studies on the benefits trough and childcare is one of the deepest parts of the benefits trough. And we talked, um, she talks in numerous reports and the Tax Commission um, shows. And then we talked with Deb two weeks ago about this idea that from essentially like you know, you're living in deep, desperate poverty 
and even the whole circle of benefits um, is not really enough to move you quite out of deep, desperate poverty. And that is terrible and stressful. And generally um, that level of economic stress leads for folks to wind up um, affiliated with family services and then their kids are taken into a custody and everything sort of tumbles from there. So there's like the whole horror and systems failure of deep, deep poverty. And then there's um, sort of one step outside of that, that's moderate poverty where everything is incredibly stressful, but you can basically pay your bills, just not all the bills every month and everything is still really stressful, but somehow you hold it together. Um, and we have, the majority of Vermonters are sort of living somewhere near there. So we have from that point, which is like 25 grand a year, basically, all the way up until when you're making around 60 grand a year, according to Deb's calculations and my own felt experience of moving through this financial, this exact financial journey um, with a child, your felt experience of your bills does not change at all because the benefits essentially disappear in line with every single dollar you make. So acknowledging that what we sort of consider an income for like a robust, resilient middle-class experience um, is not actually what happens considering costs of living in the state. And so if we do want to make a real difference in people's lives and people's ability to access childcare so that women stay in the workforce and the kids actually have good care and all the things we talked about at the beginning of the show, we actually need to make childcare accessible for families up through that threshold, which is like into $70,000 a year for a family, which I think for a lot of people, they have some story that that's like, you know, rich, rich as rich. But given all of these other costs that we have, given how benefits all bottom out, um, given how many people have significant student loan debt right now, families of young children have significant student loan debt, and given the cost of care, it's just not, it's just not without that. Um, and so that feels, it feels really exciting to me that we're developing policy, not based on some like story we have about poverty and like charity for desperate people, but in fact about like building a re resilient, meaningful social services system that Vermonters can really make it work within. Chloe, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I, I'm not sure I've heard exact, I was right taking notes actually about, um, you know, how do we talk about this notion of, well, people if, that if you're already making enough money, why do you need help? And so I think that that's, that's really helping me sort of understand it and how we can talk about it with people. And then I also think, how do, how do our budgets reflect our values? So back to, again, even if somebody, um, like helping people understand that, uh, okay, if you believe in economic development, you should also support this, right? Like it pays for itself. It's a good reinvestment and it pays for itself over years and years and years. So, you know, um, I think if, right, our value, having policy and bills like this reflect what we believe is good and right is just, and that it happens to come together with economic development. You know what I mean? It's like this, I don't know. I think it's a win-win. I don't, I don't see um, I'll be curious to see what the arguments against it are. I know that everybody's always fighting, you know, over the, you know, well, how, how can I tell the old people that I can't give them services? Like, I think that's a false argument, potentially. Um, but I will, so I will be curious to see what people come out with to argue against this bill. I also, um, I think it's important to remember that if we're going to raise wages, which we absolutely have to do if we, for all the reasons that we talked about, the cost of care is gonna to have to go up. Mm -hmm. And so in order for the cost of care going up to be sustainable, we need to support Vermonters to be able to pay for that cost of care. And so that's like, that's the two levers right there. Right, right. and that, that's another really great part of this bill too. It's not market rate. It's like, what does it actually cost? Because one of the flaws of the childcare system has been, well, here's what we can afford. You know, here's what people can afford. So that's what we'll charge, but then we'll just, you know, subsidize it with low wages and fundraising and all of those things. So, um, you know, I think having the cost of care be front and center and have everything be based on that's really important. So that's good. 
that's something so interesting, just going back to what Emily was saying about stories around um, poverty and who needs charity and who needs support, that sort of thing. Um, I, I am always amazed at, rightly or wrongly, at how often we don't actually know the true cost of things. Because we are doing something like subsidizing childcare with low wages, um, for example. And I, I sometimes wonder with Vermont, particularly so many of us have spent so much time either living with the story of scarcity or the experience of scarcity, either one, mm -hmm. that the idea, you know, you're holding on to a cliff. Uh, I have to give this, this image credit to John Hagen. Um, you're holding on to a cliff and it may not be a great handhold, but you got it and you're holding on to it. And even if someone says, well, over here's a better handhold, that feels so risky. In, in this belief of scarcity or in this sense of not feeling resilient or strong in general. Um, that I think sometimes in just in general, when we are trying to build policy that actually pulls the, the levers that need to be pulled, especially economically, I sometimes feel like we hold back. Mm. Um, or as Emily said, comes up with, come up with a great idea and then not actually fund it at the level that it needs to be funded. Um, and that is just something over and over again, I, I see and mm -hmm. still remain amazed at. Yeah. Um, Emily, I know you said that this bill is, uh, the top priority for the Democratic caucus, but have you heard as of yet any concerns about it that as we go forward might might turn into opposition or challenges. Yeah, um, so initial drafts of the bill um, or sort of initial conversations about drafts of the bill before the bill is drafted is probably the best way to describe it, which is kind of ridiculous, um, is that the funding mechanism, the sustainable funding mechanism that is named in this bill that we need to find would be from a payroll tax. Um, mm -hmm. And that was language and interest that a coalition of large Vermont, large and small, but some very large Vermont employers wanted um, in the bill um, or thought of as sort of the solution. Oh. And um, I personally working on, you know, working with the drafter didn't see a lot of value in having an argument about whether or not we should have a payroll tax when it was just going to be, the bill is actually a study committee to look at the possibility of whatever the funding mechanism was. So in that version, it would have been a study committee to look at the feasibility of the payroll tax. So I don't need to have an, argu an argument with like all of my colleagues about the feasibility of the payroll tax when we actually are just creating a study committee to look at the feasibility of the payroll tax. There's no reason to have a fight before you need to have a fight. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea of a payroll tax is incredibly divisive for a lot of very good reasons. Mm -hmm. And so if that, wound up getting back into the bill, I think that would be pretty intense. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are some people who are concerned about the governance committee um, because we have Building Bright Futures, which is our public-private partnership um, statewide that was specifically set up to sort of hold the, di the full systemic collective diversity of the early childhood system and does a very good job of that. And Chloe, I believe, is um, still on the statewide um, yeah. program. But my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong, is that Building Bright Future is actually interested in this separate governance group because, in, um, because there needs to be focused attention on this issue. Mm -hmm. Curious yeah. your thoughts, Chloe. Yeah, the, um, what the, the different, some of my initial thoughts on reading the bill was that it's great to have Building Bright Futures be a convener and a holder or something like that. Um, and the difference I see in looking at the makeup, for instance, of the advisory committee, I'm just going to check. You know, Building Bright Futures, you said public-private partnership. So that means state government employees, private folks coming together to, you know, sort of wrestle with the issues. But as such, that means that it's, it's an advisory committee that can't really sometimes say things that need to be said. And so my observance would be that this governance committee will hopefully be able to say things that need to be said. 
because um, building bright futures is trying to be neutral, the neutral conveners, like there are things we cannot be, we have to, we, we have, to have an opinion at some point. So um, that's, I, I hope that that's sort of the intent of this governance committee in the bill, I'd be curious. Um, but I think it's great that it's grounded in building bright futures or, or held there anyway. One other thing that I think could be contentious in a sort of a long-term conversation within the early childhood community is um, meaning the community of folks who work in early childhood, not the small children, is um, <laughs> whenever we talk about professionalizing the workforce and increasing the qualifications and education needed to be part of the workforce, uh, we create some degree of divisiveness. Um, we, you know, there's ongoing conversations and challenges around new Americans joining the early childhood workforce um, and what sort of comparable qualifications from a country of origin look like um, and educational requirements um, being comparable. There's working in early childhood is a really like pretty prime path um, out of poverty um, for a lot of young women. Mm -hmm. um, and a path to education for a lot of young women. Mm -hmm. And it's really one of, it's a pretty impactful way. A lot of people who never could imagine themselves going to college or even to community college, find themselves into sort of a professionalized workforce for poverty wages still, but a professionalized workforce. And so I think there's always a lot of considerations around class and access whenever we talk about professionalizing the workforce and who gets to make decisions about that, that I think we need to continue to be really sensitive about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, you know, when you think about the early childhood system and like, and this came up actually in the conversation about um, if you move childcare to AOE, to the agency of education, you know, the intention or the stated intention, well, yeah, we can manage the fact that it's a private market essentially that meets families' needs. So you have home providers, you have you know, centers, you have all these different um, ways that childcare is provided that's even more diverse than our school system. And look, they can't even get on the same page about mergers and all that stuff for their school system. How are they gonna deal with a diverse marketplace like this? But I love that this bill potentially says regulated childcare in homes and centers, like tries to acknowledge that sort of broad diversity of who enters the field and is part of the field. Um, and, and it is really important to acknowledge that tension because we, uh, yeah, we, we all have to work together. We, everybody is, like if we, you know, and we started by when you're describing like this bill, there, aren't, there isn't enough childcare right now. We can't afford to do anything that will discourage people from entering the field, that's for sure. Nope. So, um, you know, I think again, I'm, I'm hopeful that this bill can sort of helps raise us all up and not, um, but, that tension is always waiting. So. We and are just wait, about- Last oops. thing I have to say, whenever those conversations happen, there is always a number of legislators and a number of people who aren't legislators who say that we used to have a very robust system of home care providers and regulations and education requirements are decimating that field. I wanna say for like the bajillionth time for anyone who's listening, still listening, because we've been talking for so long here, um, that, there has been a lot of people who have left that field. It, it is the same rate though that it's always been. What we're seeing is less people are entering the field. So there's always turnover in home care providers because yeah. people tend to do it at a time in their life where it makes sense. Like for instance, when they have their own small children and they're planning to be at home anyway. Um, what we're seeing is that people aren't entering that field now for all of the reasons that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. So really want to sort of name that explicitly that um, there has never been like some major exodus because of all this work. Thank you. Um, so I want to give Chloe a ch the kind of last word here. So Chloe, any thoughts you want to leave listeners with uh, before we end the show? We have a great early childhood system in Vermont and it will um, continuing to invest in it and make it better is one of the best things we can do to help our state keep growing and thriving and be the best place to live. Um, and so a bill like this will help us get there. Nothing's perfect. We have a lot of work to do, but we have a really good foundation to work from and this will absolutely take us to the next level. 
Thank you so much. This has been the Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can find us at two o'clock on Fridays on the radio station, as well as Emily's YouTube channel. And on our website, the Montpelier Happy Hour .fm. Emily, if people have questions for you. Folks can find all of my contact information, Facebook, Instagram, phone number, email addresses, et cetera, on my website, which is emilykornheiser.org. And before we head out, I wanna make a quick toast to everyone who works with small children, whether you are parents or a professional or the legislature working on this bill, because as Chloe said, they are all our children. Take care, everyone. Thank yeah. you.